Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 173. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey, and I am glad that you are here. And you know what? I- I'm glad because many of you, we need to hear and have those hero stories, those transformation stories, those, oh my God, it happened to you too, and you still made it? Yes, absolutely. And I think that today's guest is going to be able to help you see yet another way how you, no matter where you're starting from, can actually end up where you want to be. In fact, in his own words, he says that he had a life of total destruction and devastation to now possesses a life that he could only dream of, which to me says he's learned a few things along the way. Today's guest is none other than Willard Barth. He's an international speaker, business consultant, coach, as well as trainer, and he's got a system called the Anatomy of Transformation, Seven Phases to Personal and Professional Success. I love that it covers both because you could fail at one, succeed at the other. You got to understand, the system is a result of 25 years of actual practice out there working and observing tens of thousands of individuals and hundreds of companies. What that means for you and I today is that it is time for us to take out that pen, that notepad, that mental notepad. If you're running on a treadmill, do whatever you got to do to remember the words that you are about to hear. Help me welcome Mr. Willard Barth. Willard, you there? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for having me on, Jay. I appreciate it greatly. I'm glad that you're here because... One of the things that gets me excited is to obviously hear all of the stories, all of the lessons and and the things that, you know, people have learned. But I'm genuinely curious about this anatomy of transformation. And we will get to that in just a moment. However, I always ask the same question uh, at the beginning because I look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, Batman, Robin, you know, Black Widow. If you've been watching the Avengers, it doesn't matter. They they all fly around and get dressed up and, you know, occasionally wear a mask or something. And they they use their tools or their skills and uh, abilities to, to help people in, in various different ways. And I think today's entrepreneurs do the same thing. However, before they got dressed up, before they had the courage to go out there and save lives, they were you know, just a normal person in a lot of cases, you know, occasionally, yeah, they got bit by a spider or maybe they fell from a different (laughs) planet, but for the most part, they were normal people. They came from somewhere. They had an origin. So before you were international speaker, business consultant, coach, trainer, working with tens of thousands of people, who is Willard Barth? Great question. Great question, and and I love the analogy. Uh, I was born and raised in uh, the central mountain area of Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't know how old our listening audience is, but a lot of times when I'm sharing with people, I ask them if they remember a TV show called The Waltons, because that's kind of where I grew up at. Wow. Uh, You know, just uh, very much middle of nowhere, uh, grew up in in a a farm community, um, and, you know, it, it was it was an interesting journey that, that brought me to where I was. You know, I don't want to start just on the downside of things, but the, the early part of my life really formed what I did now. So mm-hmm. uh, when I was eight years old, I lost my left leg to bone cancer. By the time I was 13 years old, I'd been in the hospital 13 times and had nine operations. Uh, the loss of my leg actually did two, it put me on two divergent paths. One was 
I became committed that I was not going to be any different than anybody else. Whatever anybody else could do, I would do. So two weeks after I was out of the hospital from having uh, the surgery to remove my leg, I was out riding snowmobiles with my cousins. Um, you know, by the time I was 15 years old, uh, I actually was riding street bikes and became the first licensed amputee motorcyclist in Pennsylvania. Um, I lettered in high school football. I lettered in high school wrestling. And I started my first business when I was 19 years old. So to everybody on the outside, uh, oh, and also I started making a living as a singer at the age of 15 years old. So to everybody on the outside, I, I, I looked like I was the perfect example of how you deal with overcoming you know, the, the, the tragedy of losing the leg at such a young age. But inside, I was a basket case. Mm. Uh, I was, I was angry. I was, you know, the big, the big, uh, driving question of why me, what did an eight year old child do to be punished like this? You know, I must've, I must've really made God angry and all that type of stuff. Mm. And when I was 13, I started drinking and using drugs heavily. So at 19 years old, I'm, you know, I'm starting my own business and at 20 years old, I'm facing five years in jail. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the, the development side of it, unless there was a different area you were, were asking about of who Willard was, you know, pre, pre speaker. (laughs) No, 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 no. That's exactly what I, that's exactly what I was after because, uh, from what I've gathered a lot is that, uh, there's a lot of clues in our past that typically informs our present and leads to a future that we may not have considered. Uh, and again, Where we start is not necessarily where we stay, and it, but it's always imperative to know wh- where did we start because occasionally we could come away with the, the false perception that, oh, Willard was perfect from the beginning. Of course, it's mm-hmm. always gone well for him. And I, I just want people to know that, no, we, we all have things to overcome. We're all dealt a, 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 a set of cards and how you choose to respond instead of react necessarily to those things is Mm -hmm. part of what makes the difference. I mean, the same thing happens every time you go to the negotiating table, you're building your business, et cetera. So uh, I'm kind of curious then if you're 20 facing the five years, where on earth do you get the courage or desire to even, where was that catalyst moment that makes the change? When did you get bit by the spider, man? That's what I want to know. (laughs) (laughs) Great question. Um, I ended up doing a total of 12 months between jails, halfway houses and rehabs. Um, so I, the, there, there was a sequence of events, uh, that led up to what, uh, I call the moment of clarity. Um, you know, one of the sequences of events was I got out of Baltimore city jail on August 8th of 1988. And after having spent time in multiple jails, uh, because, I, I was good. I got busted in all different places. So I had to do one month here, two months there, another month here. So I got to do the jail tour. Um, and when I got out of Baltimore City Jail, I, I just wanted to be outside for a while because, you know, as, as much as some people, uh, especially in our, in our younger generation, hype up the idea of being, uh, I hope it's okay to say a badass, uh, you know, but, 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 they, but they revel so much in that. Trust me, the jail experience is not what people think it is, and they make it out to me. Right. Um, so when when well, I got well, out, hold on, hold on. You're saying that okay. the TV isn't telling the, the the TV isn't telling the truth. It's not. It's not like that. Well, you know, a little <laughs> sensationalism uh, works well for for getting advertisers, but uh, no, it was you know, especially Baltimore City Jail. I would not have wished that experience on my worst enemy. While I was in there. Uh, they had no, they had no air conditioning in this place. And I was in there wow. in the middle of July wow. and looking out through, through, uh, you'd call it a window. I mean, it was, it was wide open <laughs> and you would see, I mean, wide open, except for the fact that it had bars on it, you would see the temperature was 104 outside and you could add probably another 10 or 15 degrees inside. Mm. And, uh, I mean, there was a riot that broke out while I was in there. Um, the, up, up until that experience, I had been, um, what's the word I want to use, kind of sequestered because, again, I was an amputee. They would normally put me in a a section with, you know, people who had not done major crimes. So, I mean, I was in there. The the actual term of it was failure to obey. And what it was was I had, okay, I always had to excel and be the best at everything. Remember this, Jay. So 
I, I achieved getting four DUIs within a five month period. Um, <laughs> and then it wasn't enough. So I had to get the fifth DUI a year later. Of course. Um, so, you know, on each of those first arrests back in 1984, when this was happening, you know, the laws weren't as strict around drinking and driving and those things. And so I would get a year suspended sentence on each of these things. So they didn't treat it like a major crime. I would be put in the, in the cell blocks with, uh, you know, people who didn't pay their child support, that type of thing. But at Baltimore City Jail, they put me into the medical section because of their concern that my crutches and things could be used as a weapon. And in the medical section, there was no separation based on crime. So cellmates included one gentleman who killed someone for $500 and a, and a case of beer, uh, child molesters, uh, rapists. I mean, it was all of it. And uh, we were right next to the psychiatric ward. So you never had silence. I mean, all night long, you had people who were screaming out and all these things. I mean, it just, like I said, it was an experience I wouldn't have wished on my, on my worst en enemy wow. um, for, for lots of reasons. But when I got out of, got out of Baltimore City Jail on, on the uh, 8th of August that year, I hitchhiked. I had I had nowhere to live. You know, I mean, they don't hold your apartment for you while you're doing the <laughs> jail tour. No. Um, and I, you know, I the only place I had to go was back to my family's house in Central Pennsylvania. And although my mother, you know, did offer to to drive to get me, it was like 250 miles away. I'm like, you know what? I need to be outside. I need to, I need to feel non confinement. So I hitchhiked from Baltimore to uh, to Lock Haven. And it was kind of on that journey, and, and as silly as it sounds, when you're in the middle of drug addiction and alcohol addiction, you can't see the devastation that you're creating for yourself and for other people. And on that that journey from Baltimore to Lock Haven, it, one of the first aha moments was, you know, this is not the life that I dreamed of when I was a kid. You know, I mean, I, I started singing at six years old. Uh, they found that I had a talent for it. Like I said, by the time I was 15, I was making my living singing. So I had dreams of Carnegie Hall and being a recording artist and, and doing all these amazing things. And here I am now an ex-convict and, you know, a, a college dropout and homeless and, and less than 40 bucks to my name. And it's like, you know, this, this wasn't the life that I planned on when, when, when I was little. And that was one of, of the things but it didn't stop me from, from the damage I was doing to myself. I got back into Lock Haven, and I was sober for maybe a month, started hanging out with the same friends in the same environment, and all of a sudden I was back to the races again. And again, I had to be the achiever, so I didn't stop at five. I went out and got a sixth DUI in 1989. Oh, come on. Okay. Yeah, totally serious. And, and it was uh, a month after that sixth DUI where – I was, you know, I had gotten back into a band when I got back to, to Lock Haven. We were one of the top drawing bands in Pennsylvania. We were playing five nights a week, and we were going into the recording studio on July 13th of 1989. So being the good drunken alcoholic that I was on July 12th, I drove to Philadelphia my, hours and hours away from where I lived at because I didn't want people to know I was still drinking as heavily as I was. I got drunk and I got arrested. Wow. And, um, you know, my, my, it was one of the most humiliating experiences of my life where again, my mother had to drive, I think it was three and a half, four hours to Philadelphia along with my stepfather to pick me up from jail. And, you know, just, just seeing the devastation in her face as she was walking up to the jail to get me after she was so proud thinking that after I'd gotten out of jail, I'd straighten out my life and I still hadn't. Wow. And, uh, it was, a, it was a month after that that I was facing going to court. And I'm like, there's no way that I'm not going back to jail again. And, and again, as I shared with you, I was mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially devastated. Everything in my life was ruined. And now the one thing that was most important to me in my life at that point, which was the music and the band and, and going and recording. Now I, I, I had thrown that away, you know, and it was, it, that was my passion for my whole life. And I was like, you know what? I had this wake up moment that, when I tell people about it, they're kind of like, well, duh. But again, when you're in the middle of the storm, you don't see it. And there were two things that happened on August 17th of, of, of 1989. 
I woke up in a parking lot, actually three things. I woke up in a parking lot, drunk from the night before, not remembering how I got there. Uh, so I was behind the wheel of a car again, drunk, you know, one month after getting my sixth DUI. And when I woke up, there was this thing of going, one of these times, I, at that point, I didn't care if I died. I mean, I, I actually put myself in situations where I hoped that people would kill me. You know, I would go into the worst part of Baltimore at three or four o'clock in the morning, places that police wouldn't go into if they didn't have a backup car. And I would be drunk and I would be screaming every racial slur and everything I could trying to get somebody to take me out. In New Jersey, I walked into a biker bar with a pistol sticking out of the front of my belt, wanting somebody to take me out. And I ended up continuing to survive. But when I woke up that morning, it was like, one of these mornings, you're going to wake up, you'll be alive, but you're going to have killed somebody else. And you're going to wake up in a jail cell every day for the rest of your life with the knowledge. It wasn't about the loss of freedom. It was about the knowledge that my selfishness, my stupidity stole somebody else's dreams. And wow. that, was, that was the tipping point for me. You know, as, as like I said, as simple as it may have sounded to other people, it's like, well, yeah, why did it take you so long to figure it out? I don't know. But that morning it was like, I'm, I'm going to wake up with that one day and I'm going to have to live with that knowledge for the rest of my life. And I couldn't, I couldn't imagine knowing that. So I made, I made the decision that I was going to clean up my life. And, uh, August 17th of, of 1989 was the last drink or drug that I've had. So it's coming up on 26 years that this journey has been going on. Wow. Well, congratulations. That's for sure. The, I guess the other side to that is you didn't decide just to clean up your life. You've, you've, decided to help other people transform theirs. Yes. And that didn't happen immediately. Trust me. That took a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean you didn't just put on the superhero cape the next day and go, yes, let's go. No, uh, I, not at uh, all. I understand. Well, then tell us a little bit. Of, how did, how did you lead up to that? I can help p other people thought process. And what was the journey there? You know, it, it's funny. Uh, af after that, waking up that morning, I, I again was facing going to court. And I'm sorry, I know I'm going very long on this story here, and I know we've got limited time. Um, I, I had to go to court, and I asked the judge to give me a chance to go into rehab. And he's like, you can go into rehab, but you're still going to jail. And I was like, I'm fine with that, but I just need to get sober. I need help. So I went into a rehab and they, they had a section where session where it was called a hot seat, where you would sit literally in the middle of the room and all of the other residents and the counselors would just hammer you and with questions. And, and the question that they kept asking me was, why are you so angry? Why are you so angry? And I didn't perceive myself as angry. Again, when you're in the middle of the storm. You're, you're totally ignorant of what's going on around you. But at one point, I just got tired of it and I broke. And I was like, okay, you want to know why I'm angry? Why me? And I just started ranting. And I won't even go into what the rant was because there were way too many expletives in there to, to, to beep out. <laughs> um, right. I was like, what did I do that was so bad at eight years old that I needed to be punished like this? And all these other, other things that came out. And I still remember the woman's name to this day. And if, if there's a miracle that she hears this, I hope she does. Her name's Mary Natoli. And she was a counselor there. And, and she looked at me. Excuse me, getting a little choked up here. She looked at me with the most compassion in her eyes and said, I don't have that answer for you. And I don't know that anybody in this physical realm ever will. She goes, but what if you asked yourself a different question? What if you asked, how can I take all of these experiences, all of these things that happened, all of the pain, all of these things, and what if you could use that to help somebody else so they didn't have to go through the same things that you did? And my immediate response was, blank you, I don't care about anybody else. I just want to stop hurting. But that question stuck with me for years. And... As I, as I progressed on my own journey, I started helping other people because that was how I grew. And then eight years into the journey, somebody recognized my skill and my ability in doing that and offered me a job as a coach. And that, that put me, that, that, that transformed my whole life by getting involved in it professionally. 
Well, and, and here's the here's the lesson I think everybody can take away from this is, uh, as I said, the past informs the present, leads to this future. But most importantly, that we we've all got stuff in our past that is probably the very seeds of the very business that we can we can create, uh, you know, for ourselves and for other people. Because the essence of business is literally just solving someone else's problems, but for a fee in compensation. And you figured that how to do that using what clearly is some of the most challenging situations that you've ever been in. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people, people ask me today, you know, when they hear my full story, they go, well, you know, if you could go back and change something, what would it be? I was like, I wouldn't change a single thing. And it's not just because of the profession. It's because of who I am as a person today. Every one of those experiences, no matter how traumatic, no matter how horrible, no matter how beautiful, Every one of those experiences have gone into the fiber of who I am. So who I am as a father, you know, everything that, that I've taught my daughter, who she is today, has come from those experiences. The relationships that I treasure so much, the friendships that, that, that are so important to me, and, and what I do as a profession now, everything came from, from being on that journey. So absolutely. I mean, I, I totally agree with you and that recognizing that, that our journey is really the, the foundation of who it is that we can become. Yeah. And, and, and more, and I, that's what I love about what, what you're sharing here now you, so you clearly have gone through this transformation yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, That, that is, that, that's obvious here. So tell us a little bit, what is, this anatomy of transformation, the seven phases. Yeah. Help me understand a little bit more about what that is and what that looks like for each person. Because I know you, you're talking about going from, as you said, total devastation to a life you can only imagine. Right. But, but there's also that transformation. I think that occurs when we just say, Hey, I want to be more than what I currently am. Absolutely. Uh, at the end of the day. And I'm guessing the process is similar. All right. Now, As you can tell, we're talking about changing. Here's a question that I want to ask you. Can you do this? Will this work for you? I get the question all the time. And one of the reasons I'm asking you that question is because the only one who knows the answer, honestly, is you. Will you be able to do the things that it's going to take to transform, to become a different person? I say yes. Here's the thing. The person you are today is likely not the person who is capable of having what it is you want tomorrow. You must do two things. You must become different. You must transform through books, through actually meeting new people and going through the process. There is no other way that I'm aware of to become a different person. No, it's not fun. No, it takes some pain, some time. But man, you can do it. and It's absolutely worth it. So now let's talk about today's winner for the prize. This week we are giving away yet another cash flow board game. So again, to enter, all you have to do is star rate and review. Again, that star rate and review the podcast. And what we do is we pick a new winner every Monday. So I'm about to announce your iTunes username. Feel free to email us at info at cashflowdiary.com, letting us know that you are indeed the winner. And we will make sure to take care of you. That's all you got to do. So star, rate, and review. Make sure you leave the written kind of review with your iTunes username or whatever name you put there so that we know who you are. All right, here we go. Today's winner is Good Vibes Mon. Good Vibes Mon. Feel free to email us at info at cashflowdiary.com and you will claim your prize. We're going to need your physical mailing address. Good vibes, mom. Congratulations. You will be able to win another copy of the Cashflow Board Game. All right. Enough of me. Let's get back to it. It is. And that's what I love about the system. I mean, I have a very dear friend who worked with me on creating a video series that I released back in 2009. And he he is a, a, a mentor and a mastermind partner with me. And we were having a conversation one afternoon. And he was saying, you know, if you were to look back over all the experiences in your life and the biggest value that you give to your clients, what what would you break that down to? What would it be? What are the organizing principles? And, I, and my first response to him was take responsibility and tapping in, into that inner strength. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, no, that's not really true. There, there's more to this. So as, as you were saying, I kind of looked back at my personal successes. I looked at my business successes. And I looked at what I was doing with my clients. 
and I recognized these seven phases were consistently present, whether it was overcoming drug addiction and alcoholism, or one of the examples I'll share is one of the clients that my consulting team works with. Uh, they're a business that's been in business for 30 years, and their transformation was the business owner had built the business to his dream. He lives in Europe. His, he want, wanted his children to experience going to school there. He has a, a management team that runs his company very well, so he only flies over when, when he's needed for meetings and, and to meet with specific clients. And they were doing $32 million a year in business. Not too bad. Not too shabby. Fif- <laughs> yeah, sounds good to me. 15 employees. You know, the, the shop's running well. And he was approached by his management team at one point, and they said, we're not happy. We're, we're, we know we can do so much more. So the anatomy of transformation is the same thing that we applied with their company and throughout their company as I applied in turning my life around. And, and I'll explain a little bit about it. You know, the, the anatomy of transformation phase one is ignorance. For all of us, there's a certain p- place where we just were not aware. We lacked the knowledge. So for me, I lacked the knowledge of the tornado that I was being to my own life and other people. So I just continued doing these things that were sabotaging my life and others. For my client, his ignorance was 30 years he built a company it was sustaining, but he didn't recognize that his team needed more stimulation, that they needed to grow. Otherwise, they would leave to pursue other businesses and his business could be in trouble after 30 years. So that moves you at some point to phase two. Hopefully, phase two is awareness. Now, awareness can come through pain, as it did for me, or awareness can come through the desire to achieve more, you know, as it did for my client. For me, it was that pain of going, if I don't stop, I'm, I'm really going to hurt people. Now, the sad part about awareness is it doesn't always guarantee you're going to move forward. When I was 18 years old... <laughs> Got to, sorry that that one that's true i've I've seen many people well being in the real estate world I, I deal with people who become aware that they like to do real estate but still don't move forward but good sorry go go ahead go ahead yeah that, that's a perfect example you know awareness when I was eighteen years old i i had i don't remember whether I got arrested that night or whether I was just really really drunk and high and knew I, I knew I had a problem at 18 years old, so I drove back to Pennsylvania, and I can remember calling my family physician, the guy who had been you know, the family physician since I was a baby. He actually was the one who delivered me and saying, doctor, I, I, I got to stop this. This is insane. And I, I, I honor him. I respect him. There was not a whole lot of knowledge around alcoholism and those things at, at that point, especially for him. He goes, you don't have a problem. You're just going through a phase. So my awareness now became my excuse. It became my story so I could continue to destroy myself, but I had an excuse for it. You know, whenever I would start be out partying and I would be rude and I'd be all these other things, ah, I'm just going through a phase. You know, right. I'll grow out of this. And and for other people, like you said, whether it's real estate, whether it's it's this the 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 business my clients talking about, they become aware that they need to grow. But then it becomes their excuse, oh, well, I, I don't know if I can do that. I, they either have a fear of moving forward or they have a limiting belief that presents them from moving forward. I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't have the education. I don't have the money. You know, these limitations that they put self-impose that keep them stuck at phase two. Oh, well, you know, one of the things that I think about is when we're afraid, any excuse will do. And, oh, absolutely. And, it, and it's often the excuse – that our friends will justify the easiest. We can easily come up with reasons why we shouldn't step into the greatness that I think we were designed to be, but you've managed to... So how does one get unstuck? How do we get past stage two then? What's stage three? Stage three is taking responsibility. That's where the taking responsibility comes in. And the first part of taking responsibility is to take responsibility for where you are and recognize that whether you love where you're at or whether you hate where you're at, you're the one who got you there. You can't blame it on your parents. You can't blame it on your education. You can't blame it on the fact that you're an amputee. You can't blame it on, you know, whatever, whatever it is, every decision, every choice, 
and every action that you've made, and that includes the choice not to take action, has led you exactly to where you are. And when you accept that, when you take that responsibility, now you can take responsibility for moving forward and say, you know what, I have the ability to design the life that I desire rather than letting life take me where I am. But the first thing you need to do is you have to take responsibility that if you, if you don't like it, you put yourself there. Own up well, to it. You, you realize we, we, we probably just lost a number of people who just stopped listening. <laughs> well, at some point, they'll come back. The seed has been planted. I understood. Understood. Keep going. Though. Yeah. So the next phase then is what I call immersion. And immersion has two parts. One is the immersion in your level of commitment to, to take that responsibility. You know, a lot of people want to try to change. They want to try to build a business. Uh, there's, there's a physical exercise that I do with people that I love to do when I'm in front of a room that demonstrates there is no such thing as try. Try is an excuse. You either do it or you don't. So when you say you're trying, if I'm having a conversation with you as a consultant or a coach, you just told me that you have no intention of following through. Try is just a, a, a word that we use to, to allow ourselves to fail with dignity. And wow. if you're my client, that, that's a word that you remove from your vocabulary immediately. So you have, to, you have to immerse yourself in your level of commitment that there is no other option than achieving your goal, achieving your result. You know, it's the whole burn the boats approach to it, going, I will succeed. And if I don't, they're, 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 you know, I will die if I don't succeed, having that like level it. of immersion. Like and then the next part of immersion is you, you can't just stick your toe in the water. You know, you have to immerse yourself in the process. You can't, like, like you're saying with real estate, you can't just listen to, you know, one audio of real estate every two to three weeks and think you're going to become knowledgeable in real estate. You have to immerse yourself in education. You have to immerse yourself in the environment. You have to immerse yourself in the process. The, the funny thing is, is that, I, 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 the person who needs to hear that isn't listening right now. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, all of those things are necessary. I mean, no matter what the business is, and I, and that's what I love about building cash flow. That's what I love about personal development. That's what I just love about what it is that we get to do as entrepreneurs. We get to filter all of these experiences through our own experiences, but yet provide them and capsulize them, package them in such a way that other people can go use them. Mm-hmm. So now that you've had the opportunity to, you know, work with a, a ton of people in various different places, what would you say has been like the number one thing that keeps you excited and, and moving forward and, and wanting to get up every day? It, it's uh, funny if I can give props to, to another person that helped me identify it. Are you familiar with Simon Sinek's work? The, uh, start with why, start with yeah, why. yeah, uh-huh. and leaders eat last, yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, start with why, phenomenal, phenomenal process, and really, Simon's process is what you were talking about earlier of looking back at your past, the the tremendous highs and the tremendous lows, and you see what fires you up. And uh, one of the challenges with it that Simon talks about is it's very hard sometimes to put that into words because it's an emotional thing that keeps you going. So, so the best way that I can answer your question about what it is that fires me up is um, I am a very spiritual person, but I am no way religious. But to connect with somebody else like you and I having this conversation right now, we, that we, we are connecting with what I call the source. And through that connection, we are tapping into and, and, and releasing true potential. And that can be through our combined minds coming together and creating an idea that's been brought out of, out of that creation. Or it can be you know, the, the connecting with each other and helping somebody overcome their fear, their limiting belief, helping them launch their business, their idea, their dream. I mean, I, I, there's nothing that juices me up more than just having these types of interactions and these types of connections where you start sharing ideas and possibilities and really get people to get the garbage off of them that's limiting them from being who they can be. Because I lived in that 
You know, I right. lived in that place of thinking, you know, I, I had belief systems that I was a monster, that I was the seed of Satan and that I was evil because of losing my leg at eight years old and going, that must wow. be the only reason that God allowed this to happen to me. So I, I carried that with me for years. And, and, the, and the beauty of what I've had now, you know, I, I got to complete my dream of being the musician and the singer and the songwriter. I released a CD of original music that one of the songs made it to 24 on the charts overseas. I had a friendship with Les Paul, who, if your listeners aren't familiar with him, Google him. <laughs> okay? I had a 17-year 17, 17 friendship with him, and I performed with him on Broadway probably close to 100 times. You know, I've, I've shared the stage um, with, with Wayne Dyer and Marianne Williamson. I worked for Tony Robbins. I, 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 the client that I'm talking about, I helped them grow their business from 15 employees and 32 million in revenue to 50, excuse me, it's somewhere now between 55 and 65 employees because they're continuing to grow and 64 million revenue, not just me, me and my team in 18 months. How can that stuff not fire you up when you're basically right. destroying the limitations that people have set for themselves? That, that, I hope I answered your question on that one because that's... Well, yeah, and that's, that's the thing that we, we strive to, to bring to the table is to let people know, whether it's real estate, whether it's business, whether whatever it is. I mean, we, I come, so when you talk of, hearing you talk about what you do is the same way that I feel about what we do when it comes to, you know, helping people get involved in real estate or just actually going out there to provide clean, safe, affordable housing and jobs. Every entrepreneur, I believe, comes from that same space of passion in that sense and they we figure out a way to package it and provide it to people at, at a price that they can afford and, and and continuing to grow and to deliver that service that is the essence and and w at the end of the day it doesn't really matter if we know how to fill out the paperwork or the contractor and what legal entity it is i mean those are pieces that yeah they they got to be done they just get in the way but that is not the essence of what your business should be about and I'm just, I, I can hear it in your voice. It is just oozing and coming from every, you know, pore of your being because it comes from that genuine place of, hey, here's what happened and I can help you at the end of the day. Absolutely. And, and every true entrepreneur that I've met, it's not, it's not been about the money for them. The money is the byproduct. You know, every, every person that I've met that, that is an entrepreneur in the truest sense of the word, it's because they have something that they're very, very passionate about. And they want to share that with other people. They want to solve other people's problems in that in that way. I mean, one to me, it was the weirdest business in the world. But one of my clients had a doggy daycare center. Okay, and I'm going doggy daycare. Really? Are you kidding me? But the passion that they had for animals and the right. passion that they had for the therapeutic approaches that they use with animals. You know, these women lived, breathed everything in it. And, and again, I mean, that people who start a business just because they go, well, I see that so-and-so is doing it and they're making great money, they're going to fail. That's been my experience. Or, or, or they're, they're going to build a business that's not based on integrity and contribution. You know, like, like you're saying with real estate, it, it, it's about helping other people both with them creating the life of their dreams but for some people just to have safe and affordable housing. You know, you're making a contribution to other people. To me, that's where the the the, the fire and and the passion come from of of knowing that you're doing something that improves the lives of of yourself and others. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So, it, I guess at this point, if someone you know was wanting to find out more of, from you and specifically how they might be able to go through these phases uh, of their own transformation and, uh, and as I like to say step into the greatness that I think we were born to be how can we track you down and find you and get more from from your wisdom and genius so that we can go out there and become the entrepreneurs that are that is lying inside well, thank you for the compliments. I appreciate that. And I have to, I also have to say any of my genius has come from the people who took the time to, to work with me. So I want to give uh, proper right. respect to them. And I do appreciate that. Um, you know, what? the, the, the easiest place to, to follow me and, and be directed to those things is really probably just following me on Facebook. 
um, because that's where I kind of disseminate into the different areas. If, if, if it's somebody who's just getting started on the journey, I have a website that has videos that uh, are called self awareness 101. Uh, you know, the power, uh, excuse me, the anatomy of transformation. I'm actually working on releasing a website for, so, uh, you know, you can just find me facebook.com slash Willard Barth, uh, W I L L A R D is in David B is in boy, A R T is in Tom H. And uh, from there, I, I, that's kind of where I put out where my live speaking events are at and where the resources are and, and all those things. Excellent. Excellent. Now, as I always like to, I always like to ask this question. Uh, is, let's pretend someone is standing in front of that superhero store right now. They're picking out their cape. They want to put on their mask. They think, okay, these tights are going to fit and I can actually help people. However, they're still feeling a little trepidation, a little scared, a little intimidated. They're like, well, but there's still so much I don't know. I need to know all of these other things first before I get started. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that person? I would say your superpowers are in your story. And that's what you have to believe in. You know, I've had people... Uh, you know, through my website and through my videos and through my other things come to me and say, you know what, I've been to the Tony Robbins seminar, I've read Wayne Dyer's books, but I didn't get it until you said it. And it's not that I'm a better speaker than Tony or that I'm more profound than Wayne. It's the fact that they resonated with my story. They resonated with my experiences. They were, like you said, I think at the top of, top of the interview, um, you know, it's like I, I, I can I can trust him because he's walked the path. He's been there. These other guys, they're talking about things I just don't get it. And when your 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 superhero costume really is every experience you've had in your life. So so face those fears, whether it's fear of failure, fear of success, fear of you know being in front of people, and, and any of those limiting beliefs that pop up. And the way you identify a limiting belief is you fill in the blank. I can't because fill in the blank. I can't because I'm too young. I'm too old. I don't have the experience. I don't have the money. Just identify that and say, you know what? That's BS. It's both the expletive word for it and it's also a belief system. And I get to choose whether I'm going to limit myself or I'm going to choose an empowering belief system. So maybe you say I can't because I don't have the money. And you go, you know what? That's BS. I always have the money for what's important to me. I find a way. I will make it happen. I don't have the education. That's BS. I can learn anything that I need to learn. And you just you just commit yourself to knowing that every part of your journey has been a blessing and a gift. And, and that is where your superpower comes from. Indeed, sir. I definitely appreciate everything that you've shared today. And I, I hope everyone listening appreciates it too. Thank you for taking the time to invest with us here at the Cashflow Diary. And thank you so much for having me on. I, I'm totally honored and I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what it's time to do? It's time to move at the speed of instruction. You know you heard something that you liked. So track them down. Get there. Make some actions happen. Find out when his next event is and be there. Don't just be there. Be present. And don't just be present. Be in the front row. Show up early. Because at the end of the day, you know that you want to be more than what you currently are. And you can find a way to express that. Let your genius come out. Now is the time. The world is literally waiting for you. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.